During the Cold War, the virtually undetectable ballistic missile submarine offered America the ultimate deterrent. But the fundamental principles of today's nuclear submarines made their first appearance in 1776, when American freedom was threatened by a different enemy. The largest British fleet ever dispatched was poised to attack New York, after the American colonists issued their Declaration of Independence. Britain was determined not to lose her most valuable colony, and the Royal Navy was tightening its noose around George Washington's revolutionary forces, holding out on the tip of Manhattan. As the rebels had no warships of their own, the odds for New York were overwhelmingly in favor of the British. But Washington had a secret weapon that could dramatically alter the balance of power. An underwater vessel that could attach a huge bomb to the vulnerable underside of the British warships. It would be the first time a submarine was used in warfare. From the scant evidence contained in a single letter written by the inventor, a team of amateur submarine builders will attempt to recreate the first submarine. Nicknamed the Turtle, it was built in secret in Seabrook, Connecticut by David Bushnell. Little is known about Bushnell and no remains or plans of his submarine survive. The only reliable information is a letter Bushnell wrote to Thomas Jefferson some years after it was built. Was fixed a quantity of lead for ballast. Using this description, a team led by Laura and Rick Brown will make an authentic working replica. Floating in the harbour where the submarine launched its attack on the British is New York's intrepid museum. It has a full-scale model of Bushnell's turtle. Rick, Laura, and metal worker Matt Hinksman have come to inspect it. How are you doing? Welcome aboard. Thank you. Hi. How are you doing? They're anxious to see how Jerry Roberts interpreted the evidence. So this is so, your turtle. A non-submersible turtle. Looks kind of small in there. This shape of that. That's not much of a rudder. Uh, This hatch just seems gigantic. It's, I mean, I, you can fit two or three people up inside. It's, I mean, I, I actually, he refers to it as a hat, right. with a brim and a crown. And where's is this? Pretty much just crown in the brim. It's all crown, not too yeah. much brim. You know, in Bushnell's letter, he refers to it to the body as uh, like two turtle yep. shells coming together. Right. And where you would enter at the top, uh, right. where the head would be. Sure. And that's that's the that's the extent of his description of the body. He said several large pieces of wood. He didn't say two large pieces of wood. And the other thing is he comes from a very New England shipbuilding area where ships were made with planks and barrel staving was the common way to join wood and On the sure. same point, right. it is described as, like the bomb, it is made of scooped out large right. oak pieces. So by referring to the bomb, right. he's kind of telling you sure. his process. Its ability to the team decide to follow their instincts about the turtle's hull design. It will be scooped out of a single eight-ton log at Rick and Laura's workshop near Boston. Bushnell used oak, but the team's log is spruce. <laughs> Henry Russell off? will carve it by hand. Hang on. I've been counting the rings of this log, and the, um, uh, the first 50 years comes about to here, so the vast majority of this tree is made up with this first 50 years, and gradually the speed of growth slows down. So we're looking at a tree that's probably 350, 380 years old, and um, the, this last growth is incredibly slow. So actually when Bushnell was... Uh, was working on this submarine was uh, 50, 100, 150, 225, was actually here. So that this tree was probably big enough to, to build a submarine with when Bushnell was working on it. The team's first task is to divide the log into two halves. Henry's theory is that Bushnell simply split it instead of using a saw. You can hear it popping apart in there. 
Although splitting is faster, there's less control. Yeah, obviously, the grain inside is doing wobbling about quite a bit, but that's split now lower than where we'd hoped. That's un a little bit unfortunate. I mean, just imagine sawing that. There you it goes. That would, you'd be here oh, breaking for days. days. Yeah. Beautiful. Perfect. <laughs> what do you want to know? The tiller configuration here. Yeah. Okay. What's going to happen is, is that Rick and Laura teach sculpture at Massachusetts College of Art. They want to construct the turtle using the tools of the time. A full-sized mock-up of the submarine will help them work out the position of the controls. I don't know if, if it's going to fit or not, but this will be our, could be our vertical propeller. It might oh, be a little big. We were big. just worrying about that, talking about that. Put, put the, Matt the, has agreed to pilot the submarine. Like he will enter through a hatch on top and use two hand crank propellers. One moves the turtle up and down through the water, the other forwards. Yeah, still. Yeah. I would think you'd want it as close well, to knuckle clearance as you can get, because that gives you that much more room to do everything else. The mat mobile. I want a cup holder right there. <laughs> See? Perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. Well, why can I actually turn it? Yeah. Now, <laughs> you operate this with this hand and in your rudder with the other. Of course, I won't be able to see anything. <laughs> <laughs> Matt discovers that navigating the turtle won't be easy, as the driver's seat is well below the portholes in the hatch. He'll have to stand up at frequent intervals. Best is a. You got to be up on the floor. Okay. And then it kind of comes. Looking at this mock-up, it definitely has a um, Heath Robinson uh, feel about it. When you see these propellers, one going up and one going horizontally and you think about them just being turned with a little crank, it seems very unlikely, but we'll see, we'll see. It can't have been uh, easy going in a heavy tide or with a current. It must have been a, a real nightmare, in fact. Reports of the submarine's attack describe how shortly before midnight on the 6th of September, 1776, Bushnell's submarine braved the currents and tides of New York Harbor to attach a mine to the British flagship, HMS Eagle. In the summer of 1776, Washington was in a really increasingly difficult position. He lost Long Island, he was forced off Brooklyn Heights onto Manhattan. And his problem really is that Manhattan is surrounded by water. With British command of that water, it was possible that he might find himself entirely cut off. Washington needed luck, he needed miscalculation on the part of his enemies, but most of all, he needed some sort of secret weapon that could, if only briefly, do something to take the sting out of that considerable naval threat which was poised in New York Harbor. David Bushnell asked his brother Ezra to test the submarine. He conducted trials for over a year before the New York attack. During this time, Ezra would have learned all the skills needed to maneuver the turtle below an enemy ship. The climax of the mission was when he had to drill a bit into the ship's underbelly, leaving the mine attached to the hull on a length of rope. It was an ingenious plan, but could it ever have worked? The United States Naval Academy is helping the team by running preliminary tests with a scale model of the submarine in Indianapolis. The amateur sub-builders may be confident, but Navy engineer Lou Knuckles has doubts. I think you could make a strong case that it never existed, that it was a, an elaborate hoax. There, there are a number of technical discrepancies. What we're seeing, what was said in the literature, in the historical documents, just couldn't have occurred. Bushnell's letter certainly requires interpretation. Was the hatch he describes as brass actually cast in bronze? Or would he have improvised? Every household has several copper pots, from small to very, quite large. It's very conceivable that Bushnell actually could have you know, just used an existing pot and then made perforations and worked from a found object. 
at the same time, it was a process that was accessible. It's, more, it's probably more likely that they just commissioned a coppersmith to fashion the crown for their needs. Da -da -da -da. <laughs> It's a, it's a real salad bowl, this is. To actually carve this hollow has taken about two days for two people, which is perfect. I think it's quite, actually quite fast. One of the problems with timber is that it shrinks, and it shrinks at a different rate. As it, as it dries, you start getting a lot of tension building up. Um, and in fact, um, you can see some of these sort of tent This is dried out, this piece, and you can see some of these cracks opening up here. If we get any big cracks like this, the water could just come pouring in. Bushnell gained experience in dugout hulls from using them as bomb casings. Although he built a submarine, his primary interest was explosives. From his experiments at Yale, he discovered that gunpowder behaved in a remarkable way underwater. Matt will get a taste of Bushnell's experiments from explosives expert, Sidney Alford. Okay. We have about five seconds. That would make quite a good party trick, to make a bang even <coughs> as feeble as that one and still have the capsule, oh, um, which is slightly bulged, but that's right. all. Nothing happened. You did see that a lot of gas was generated, uh -huh. and that gas had to go somewhere. Next, Sydney will ignite the same quantity of gunpowder underwater. So the tape just holds it there, but the water pressure should be enough, basically, to to hold that back, that gunpowder, so it'll poke a hole in the bottom. It will um, hold in right. the gases that are, really, ah, are generated as that powder explodes. Okay. The tape is merely to prevent the thing drifting away from the hull. OK. All right. Just... Here we go. Thank you. Okay. We have a total of about 39 seconds. Oh! There we go. <laughs> there we are. Get straight into shore. Yep. No! <laughs> they don't make boats like they used to. That's a pretty big hole. It's a wonderful illustration of the enormous effect of water tamping. Yeah, right. It shows that uh, even that much um, weight of water right. can fi holds the gas in long enough to cause an enormously enhanced amount of damage. Bushnell developed a timing mechanism to trigger the blast and went on to invent the world's first underwater mine. He then started work on his submarine, which would plant the mine under British warships. Matt has come to Portsmouth with military historian Richard Holmes to assess the turtle's target. This is HMS Victory, which is actually a good deal bigger than Lord Howe's flagship HMS Eagle. Right. But she was about at the time of the American War of Independence, and its job in life was to form a line and hammer away at the opposition's line with extremely heavy cannonballs. By the sun of the age, it would have been it would have been a monster, smacking out broadside after broadside after broadside right. from these heavy guns. It's really a great big gun carrying platform. So the Americans they had nothing at all to really combat this kind of a, a fleet. There's nothing that the Americans can do at this stage in proceedings against a warship like this. But have really got no direct answer, which I think makes Bushnell's attempt to right. find the indirect solution, the asymmetric solution, yeah. all the more important. I think it took remarkable insight on Bushnell's part to recognize that the, the line of battleship, the dominant weapon system of the age, did have an Achilles heel. Uh, it, it's extraordinarily strong, the battleship. It's designed to absorb fantastic punishment, and they're actually quite difficult to sink. However, if you can get an explosive charge underneath them, then that great strength is converted into a great vulnerability. The challenge for Bushnell was to find a way of attaching the bomb to the ship that would allow the operator to escape before it exploded. 
He designed a drill bit or auger that could be anchored to the hull. I'm, a, hard. Yeah, I'm attempting to uh, drive the auger into the bottom of that plank representing the British ship. The HMS Eagle. HMS Eagle. Am I digging? Now you're digging in, yeah. Yeah, keep going. Keep Actually, going I wanna, I'm going to go until I feel like I'm stopped. No, that's pretty good. Oh, that's good right there. And now I can hold my crank and I can undo this. Yeah. Now I can and use my... Pull down a little, little further, a little loose. further. Okay, there you go. The drill will become part of the hatch, the most complex component of the submarine. It's the most complicated portion of the metal working with all the doors and the windows that have to be applied through it and ventilators, etc. We have some excellent caps for our windows. Yeah, we're on our way to having a complete submarine. <laughs> Right now, I'm just tapping the edge of the, the lead over, so it's a little bit of jewelry. To withstand water pressure, Bushnell made the windows very small. With probably the least streamlined shape of any vessel ever built, the hulls planed smooth to reduce drag. Separate teams have worked on each half. Now they face the ultimate test of their skills. Will the halves fit together to form a watertight seal? This is an important moment. We're just going to see how close our flat cuts in the middle are. We have a turtle. Well, it's looking very impressive, but I, I can't work out whether I'm more skeptical now than I was before. Why are you skeptical? <laughs> I think the shape is, you know, why not make a, if they're going to make a shape, maybe they, an elongated shape that way. And that's what really surprises me, is that they've done something that's so, that's so blobby. They would have been seeing boats all over the place, even if they weren't boat builders. And they must have known, had some idea about what travels through the water, what travels through water easily. I think the primary concern was being able to get to go underwater in a vessel with a human being and to be able to travel a relatively short distance and to deploy the bomb. So he wasn't thinking about a, a boat and a, and a craft that was going to be able to be really maneuverable so much under the water. Mm. The key thing he was concerned about was having a, uh, a material and a form that could withstand the pressures by going deep. The two halves join together almost perfectly. But the Naval Academy conducts a test, suggesting this great buoyant egg will need a large amount of ballast to weigh it down in the water. Our analysis shows that when we place a thousand pounds on the, the turtle uh, hull as described by uh, Bushnell, we're going to see a, a substantial amount of the hull floating out of the water. Uh, what we see, a uh, thousand pounds is not near enough. In fact, we would need somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,500 to 4,000 pounds of ballast to result in a hull that is slightly bobbing on the surface, as we can see here. Now, in this case, this is the way we would like uh, the turtle to be on the surface, moving towards the HMS Eagle. This is a major problem that I see with the current design that's documented in history. Today, Lou and his research team will reveal the results of their scale model tests. Does this turtle look like this one? I, I thought yeah, so. I could tell that. So this is, this this is the, yellow, the yellow submarine. Okay. Right here. So, I mean, it, it, all, it all boils down to, I, I guess, the discussion we were having coming up here and what we've had in, uh, in the past is the, the conflict between the dimensions and the ballast requirements, the historical documentation, just don't jive. And, you know, one theory that we keep uh, throwing out there is, was there really a turtle? It's uh, the, the number, I, I, I question your, your thing of it being a myth. Well, that's... <laughs> and the numbers were not given by, the, by uh, Bushnell himself. So, uh, you know, it's an interesting notion. Laura thinks that Lou is overlooking the possibility that Bushnell used removable lead weights to allow the turtle to float at different levels on the surface of the water. Tonight, they're casting the permanent lead keel. In addition to the lead ballast attached to the bottom of the submarine, Bushnell invented a system of temporary water ballast. 
A foot valve allows water into the submarine. This additional weight causes it to sink. There you go, Christian. Dolve it up there, bud. Yeah. Two hand-operated pumps expel the water and permit the turtle to rise. Bushnell even devised a depth gauge so the pilot knew his position in the water. Laura has prepared a traditional corking from cotton, pine tar and hemp rope. Bottom corner, is that, how's that doing? What I think will be the most interesting part is the, the, the sound underwater. I'm interested in that and also the lack of visibility, really. Uh, I think that'll be interesting and in how uh, I'll have to rely completely on tactile controls now. Because I can imagine you could get turned around quite easily under there. The tiny windows make it very dark inside. But Bushnell discovered a solution a phosphorescent fungus found on rotting logs called foxfire. He used bits of it to illuminate the compass and depth gauge. Underwater, Matt will be steering virtually blind. The only air the pilot had to breathe was the air he brought down with him. The environment inside the turtle would have been horrendous. Our calculations indicate that within uh, 30 minutes, the atmosphere would become so uh, toxic that uh, it would be extremely uncomfortable and that you would have to surface or go unconscious. If the buildup of toxic air is not bad enough, Matt could face the possibility of a catastrophic leak. Navy diver Rich Schernwiesner's advice is don't panic. The problem is if if it does start to leak and we have a problem, you're not going to be able to open the hatch or anything right. else to get them out until the pressure's equalized on both sides. So that may, we may have to fill a lot of it up to be able to do that. Yeah, that or I've got an ax that'll go through the cap <laughs> copper on that hatch. Yeah, yeah. Well, and we should we should talk about um, if we if something does happen and we lose communication. Mm -hmm. Well, if we if, lose communication, if I lose communication with you, out. it's coming it's out. Coming out. Right. After two weeks of intense work, the turtle is ready to be christened in Duxbury Harbour. It needs about three metres of water for a total immersion. There's a race to catch high tide, or there'll be a long cold wait in the dark until the next one. Let's get it wet. <laughs> All right. As predicted by Lou Knuckles and the Naval Academy, the turtle needs additional lead ballast to submerge it up to just below the hatch. We're on the bottom. We're on the bottom. That's so we can't get the hatch below water now. We start. Okay. Well. With the turtle sitting on the mud, the dive has to be abandoned until the water rises again just before dawn. Can't control Mother Nature. <laughs> to give the hatch a good seal, the felt gasket is soaked with Laura's concoction of lard, linseed oil, turpentine and beeswax. Can I seal me in tight? Yes. But will it keep Matt dry? Mm -hmm. I can hear the fat sort of squishing. It's like making little 
It's dripping fat. It's disgusting. That's great. Take no more. I can feel the pressure increasing already. Jim, Chris, can you put your hands on top of the hatch and just push down? You've been in 17 minutes, Matt. I think all we're going to get done this time is to get the hatch underwater, and then you start pumping and come out. Well, um, guys, take it easy on Matt there, huh? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. OK, Matt, you're fully underwater. What are the windows doing? <laughs> yeah, I can't see anything out this window. I can see light, yeah. Yeah. OK. Matt, why don't you try the propeller, see if it does anything. Whoa, I'm moving. Son of a gun. Thing actually works. Yeah. All right, man. Hey. Yeah. All right. Rich, you happy? Yep. Okay, Rich is happy. Tell me when I get to the bottom of the doors. Take it on water. Oh, I can see the water through the window. Through the front window. Cool. All right. Any any leaks around the brim, Matt? Actually, nothing's leaking. I can... Oh, wait, well, I, no, I, I do have a little leak. It's not big, it's just a dip, 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 Chinese water torture sort of thing. As the 30-minute limit of the dive approaches, a combination of oxygen depletion and rising carbon dioxide levels increases the chance of Matt losing consciousness. Yeah, Matt, uh, Matt, are the pumps working okay? Why don't you start pumping and get it so we can get the hatch out of the water and then we can... Uns Matt? Matt, you there? Okay. Guys, cable up. I can't hear Matt. Let's go. Cable up. Cable up. Matt, are you there? Okay. Cable up. Cable up. Let's go. Come on. Cable up. Break the hatch. It turns out Matt's fine. It's just the communications that died. Well, there's a will, there's a way. You just proved that a bunch of non-boat builders can build a submarine, which is what's happened 250 years I ago. Know. I know. I'd like to go back in again and test it. I'm really interested to see how well you can control the neutral buoyancy and, and really see if you can pick up some speed and that, get a weight going behind it, you know. Um, no water skiing behind it, I'm sure, but like, I'm really, I think it's going to be amazing to see it in their tank down in Annapolis and mm -hmm. see how it really works off tether. The turtles' trials continue at the test tank of the U.S. Naval Academy in Indianapolis. <laughs> First up is the drag test. Could the Tarshall reach three miles an hour, as claimed in an account by the operator? What drove you guys to the, to the whip? Why did you end up with the five-foot whip? I mean, you're just, you just trying to interpret it's, it's, what was written. Yeah, it's not conclusive. See, I'm working, I'm working it from a hydrodynamic point of view. From a hydrodynamic point of view, if you cut the beam one foot, you change the drag coefficient, you cut it in half. There's no way that Ezra could have gone three miles an hour. It's more like maybe a half a mile an hour at best. So what is that saying, Luke? It's saying that the rudder is going to be meaningless. <laughs> the, uh, the rudder is not going to allow you to turn the, uh, the turtle at all. It's, uh, what's happening is the water apparently is going up underneath the turtle, and then it's flowing up behind it in an upward direction. When you're trying to turn it, you have no control whatsoever. It, uh, I, I think it really is. You're at the mercy of the current. I don't think it could have done the mission that it was set out to do. Superman wasn't inside of it, and it would have had to have Superman inside of it to have done the mission. So, I mean, I think it was a brilliant hoax. Problem is the amount of power it would take to go any distance for any length of time. He can't deliver that kind of power. Lance Armstrong couldn't deliver that kind of power. Oh, look at this. 
Welcome home. Well, it's the it's the 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 old makers and maybe the new makers. You know, we we work in uh, in a more uh, empirical, hands-on, uh, old materials world, and they are in the virtual. Uh, computer world and I don't know that you'll ever find out what's accurate so uh, I do think that it worked for Bushnell and if this doesn't work at all then then maybe there's something that we need to readjust in our design we'll see well I'm hoping to see how well the object moves and, and to actually feel the rudder and feel the uh, forward propeller and, and see how well I can move about in the water which I didn't get a chance to do before I'm thinking about how I can definitely get the treadle in here before we do this the next time. Matt's top speed is a turtle like half a mile an hour. Basically, what we've proved here is that it probably wasn't very fast. <laughs> and that the three miles an hour could be referring to the tides as well. I'm going to spin myself all the way around the other way. Matt quickly discovers the only way to get the rudder to turn the turtle is by sculling. Doing a good job. That looks like a fish <laughs> tail. Actually, moving the orange, rotating the turtle is quite easy. It is, yeah. Sculling really works well. Matt is ready to take the turtle underwater to see how easily he can control its buoyancy. Lou has a warning ballasting pumps. Now this is just a little demonstration about what I think uh, we'll be seeing and how sensitive it's going to be to take on water and be able to pump it back out again. As you can see the the, uh, the turtle, our, our simulated turtle here, is just bobbing on the surface. Assuming we've uh, put in the right amount of lead for, for fixed ballast, we're going to have to bring on an additional about 300 pounds of water for this to submerge. What I'm going to do now is just inject uh, water as, uh, as it would be coming into the, the, the inlet valve. Now I think what's going to happen as soon as we start getting water going into the, the uh, turtle, as you can see it should start submerging. And there it goes. And, it, and of course at that point you can see how, how rapidly it starts going beneath the surface. Um, now, what I, as, as soon as it went beneath the surface, I started pulling the water back out again. And I think that's what uh, you're going to want to do tomorrow, as soon as you start seeing the, the turtle going down, mm -hmm. meaning that we are slightly negatively uh, buoyant now, you're going to want to start pumping. Because it's going to drop like a stone. Because it's going <laughs> to drop like a stone. And you can see if, if we continue just pumping it in, there's a certain amount of mass there, so it's going to take a while for it to start reacting. But once it starts, it goes. Wow. The amazing thing, though, is that this system that, that Bushnell designed in 1775 is what's being used in, in nuclear submarines today. It's, uh, mm -hmm. So it was way ahead of his time. Shortly before Bushnell's brother was due to attack HMS Eagle in the Turtle, he became seriously ill and was replaced by an inexperienced pilot named Ezra Lee. In a strange twist of fate, Matt Hinksman suffers a similar disappointment. As he is about to relive the experience of piloting the turtle, the Navy insists that only qualified divers will be allowed underwater in the submarine. So Matt is bumped off the mission to be replaced by the turtle's most outspoken skeptic, Lou Knuckles. The way this is going to have uh, Lou Knuckles going to be the operator, reasons to abort the test as we talked yesterday, if we have a loss of comms, if anything is damaged, either a person or a piece of equipment, I was very much um, aware of the risks, I think, in Duxbury. I really was, and, but willing to do it. Uh, and I think that not a lot of people would al allow themselves to, to do that. I mean, we, we were on our own. You know, we weren't uh, under an institution like we are here that's requiring certain safety parameters. Um, but I also think I wouldn't have done it if I felt unsafe. Uh, and I, I'm not a reckless person. Counterclockwise is forward. No, counterclockwise is forward, okay. I'm going to try the foot valve just to see uh, how it comes in. Right pump is obviously working. All right, the left pump is real easy, but I'm not sure it's pumping. 
when we were having problems with the pump, it actually wasn't forcing water out. I actually have the uh, original hose that we placed in here. It's a hose made out of wrapped leather. Um, and under the pressure, the water going in and out of the vessel, you can see that it's actually collapsed a little bit on the interior. It could have actually ruptured. Um, if it had collapsed, if it had sprung a leak, there would have been no way to stop the water from entering the vessel, and the submarine with uh, Lou Knuckles would have gone straight down to the bottom of the tank. Water's up over my ankles. Okay, you're right at the top of the crown, so you probably should stop flooding. Let's see where we settle. Okay, no leak. Up, oh, up, oh, yep, there we go. <laughs> we, got, we got a nice little shower there. Lou had forgotten to shut off the ventilator valve. That's two and a half. Looks like you're neutral at this point. Okay. Neutral buoyancy is basically when the turtle is floating submerged beneath the surface of the water, it's neither going up nor down. It's just hanging out there. Um, if he achieves neutral buoyancy, he should be able to, with, with relative ease, using the vertical propeller, move himself up and down in the water. Okay, try the vertical prop. Okay, he's holding. Oh, he's coming back up. Yeah. Coming back up. Yeah. How about if I go down? Yep. Yes, you're going back down. You're at eight, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. I'm on the bottom. Even though we have landed. What we're going to do is just try to recreate what Ezra Lee did at the HMS Eagle. We're going to try to move beneath and try to plant our auger into the, uh, the bottom of the HMS Eagle. If you can imagine Ezra Lee in this little seven-foot wooden sphere underwater, um, intentionally paddling himself amidst a 400-ship fleet of the world's greatest and grandest navy, and directly above him is a, is a probably a 150-foot warship with five or six hundred men on it, uh, highly trained, highly equipped, and, and here he is, one person in the dark, you know, making this literally a little stab for freedom here to try to repulse the great navy. Examining the giant hull at HMS Victory, Matt and explosives expert Sidney Alford tried to work out how difficult it would have been to sink a big warship. Sidney first needs to know the thickness of the hull below the waterline. Thinner here. Here, in fact, if we go in, in here where it's set back, it's only yeah. 17 inches. 17, yeah. All right. Well, there's a spot down here where I think we can measure the thickness of the, the hull right near the keel here. The average thickness of the hull is nearly a meter of solid oak. I can stick my hand all the way down. I can't even stop. I can't even. Initially, Sydney recommends placing the mine on the flat underside of the ship until they realize this may be the worst place. Yeah, so you can kind of see it. There's this ballast behind you. There's all this pig iron. These kind of billets would be everywhere along the uh, bottom of the ship. I mean, these are pretty heavy. Oh, my god. That probably weighs 80 pounds anyway. And how would have that actually impacted the our... The whole bottom of the ship? Yeah. I would say it would make an enormous difference to the size of bang that you're going to need to perforate the hull. Uh, that's equivalent to about about 18 inches of armor. The sheer mass of it will be trying to hold the timbers down right. as the explosive is trying to splinter them inwards. It will make a terrific difference. The target is a much tougher target yeah. than I would have expected. The placing, I would say, will probably be crucial. And what it means is, I think that it will be impracticable for them, uh, ineffective of them to try to place a charge under the flat part of the hull, which otherwise is the place of choice. Right. It's most stable and you've got the greatest head of water. I think they would have been forced to place the charge on the rising part of the hull. How on earth could they have stuck a mine on the outside, on the sloping, a rising part of the hull? Yeah. There's not that much metal to wood ratio. You know, there's very little metal actually on the hull, but in fact, Ezra Lee uh, says that he must have hit something in the backside of the ship, whether it's one of these uh, hinge straps up above or the copper sheathing that would have uh, been covering the whole keel. I would have thought that if he'd hit that, he would have said, oh, damn, moved over right. slightly and tried again. Right. So if he actually had gotten the auger stuck into the vessel, and we would hope then that this positively buoyant mine would float up and sit against the side of the, 
of the hull, the ship's yes. hull. Okay, so I'm, I'm coming at you, Eagle. It's difficult to see where I'm going. I have to stand up so I can stop. And I can't imagine how Ezra Lee could have found his way up underneath the ship. All right, coming up. Coming up. All right. Okay, I'm, I'm just going it around to try to get it aligned again. Coming up, coming up, using vertical prop. Nothing yet. Coming up. Yep, I think I've got it. But uh, I'm not sure I'm going to keep it. Looks like you're in. Can you disconnect? I'm going counterclockwise. On the internal? On the auger, yes. I've turned it, turned it. It should have been disengaged. He's stuck in there. Looks stuck. Looks like he's, he's stuck. stuck. Divers, someone knock on the side of the tank. Get their attention. He needs to release. He needs to back. Is he stuck? He needs to it looks like it. It hasn't been disengaged. OK, drop, drop down. So I'm going to flood. No, go ahead and use the prop. No prop, OK. Yeah, you've been flooding enough. This auger's stuck in this CO2 levels building up. She's got about three minutes left before we have to have him switch over to breathing air from the scuba bottle. Yeah, he can understand. He can, he can. The divers are trying to disengage you. Surprise that. Well, you know what? We added that extension to it. Yeah, I could. We never tried it. That was done. OK. You've been disengaged. I backed it out at least But you have times. to drop down. You have, down. To, you have, you to, have to dive down. If you have backed it off, yeah. you're still engaged. And so the only way we're released is if you go down. And you only have to drop about an inch or an inch and a half. Even worse than the case that we had thought about a great deal was the, the fact that now the auger is stuck in the bottom of the ship. And even if I flood, we can't open the hatch. So uh, I think in Ezra Lee's case, he would have been a goner at that point. The events of the night of the 6th of September, 1776, turned into a different kind of nightmare for Ezra Lee. When the turtle was cast off from the rowing boat, it was swept past the HMS Eagle in a strong outgoing tide. Ezra had to paddle back against the current for two exhausting hours before he finally submerged below the Eagle. Lee described in a letter how his drill was deflected when it struck metal, and with dawn approaching, he decided to abandon the attempt to attach the mine. Ezra returned to the battery. En route, he released the time bomb, which as planned, exploded 30 minutes later. I think the chances of him actually succeeding were extremely low. The currents had to be exactly right and push him against the eagle for him to be able to slide down the side. So he had to do this extremely uh, quickly. It was a stab in the dark, literally, for him to try to attach that auger. And everything had to be just, uh, uh, the luck had to be with him. Lou makes one final attempt to attach the mine to the hull. OK, this is going much, much better. Okay, okay, you've got it. Jam it. Stick it. Ah, oh, yeah. Okay, you're in. All right, let me come up. Let me come up. All right. Okay. It looks like I got it. All right, I'm backing the auger out. You're free. All right. 
I would like to think that the turtle existed. Uh, and no one's ever seen it. It's really the limitation is the, the, your senses of where you are. Right. The turtle works perfectly. Are you surprised? <laughs> not, not after I saw what you guys did <laughs> oh, in January. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> you guys are incredible. All right. Well, well, congratulations. Good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> The success of Lou's mission has changed his mind about the turtle. <laughs> hey. My skepticism has been wiped. <laughs> no longer. I totally believe. I believe in the machine. That's like that's like a workout for sure. When I saw that propeller go round and right. go forward, that's uh, you know absolutely. Um, you just suddenly realise the whole thing's possible. Every single thing that you thought wasn't possible you know, has proved to be pretty well possible. Incredible. <laughs> it is. When Ezra Lee was towed from the tip of Manhattan, his mission was fraught with danger. With 150 pounds of gunpowder perched just behind his head, he had to evade the British and brave the fierce currents between the Battery and Governor's Island. That's Governor's Island. And that's out where the uh, fleet was. If I had been Ezra Lee on that night, and knowing that uh, out there, there were about 500 British ships waiting, I would go out there. Or I could wait for the British ships to come in and take my life. So I think that would be the decision. History has shown that young men and women all over the world in times like this time in 1775 have the courage to mount a vessel like that and to take on that task, even though it's for, it seems very uh, frightening and, and a daunting task, that they have the courage and they, they go for it. After the failed attack on HMS Eagle, the turtle made two more unsuccessful attempts at sinking British warships. By now, Bushnell was seriously ill and lacked the funds to train a new operator. Disheartened, Bushnell abandoned his submarine for good. I think that if he could have stuck with it, he would have really uh, worked out a lot of these problems. I think his task was beyond instant success. You know, he had so many things against him, but he was very, very, very close. After the war, Bushnell disappeared to France, only to return to his native soil late in life. He settled in Georgia, assuming the name David Bush. His underwater adventures would remain a secret until his death. Bushnell is, is certainly one of the two or three gurus of the submarine, and I think quite underrated in history. The turtle was so ahead of its time that it would take another century before the next submarine was used in war. What David Bushnell was doing was something that no one had ever done. It was going into a completely different realm. It's like us going out into space nowadays. I mean, really, he was doing something that people hadn't even conceived of doing. <laughs>